I don't usually post pictures of my kids online, but they're infants and you can barely see them, so you know it's it's fine. But a YouTuber named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone tweeted, showing off the F trophies for clout. So the babies are trophies that I'm showing off. It's perhaps not a surprise that a picture of a proud father would be so upsetting to the sort of man who clearly never had one. T2458 Learning Corp Little Red Riding Hood, take one. I don't think I've ever. I don't think I've ever actually watched this whole thing through. I forgot how it goes. Alright, whatever. I guess we're doing it. Oh, yeah. I remember now. Alright, whatever. It's, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyways, welcome, boys. Red morning. Uh, fun, fun, fun day for you. It's one of those days. I guess I'm hosting Rule Zero. Promised myself I wasn't going to for, for a while now, but I guess I broke that promise. But we may, may or may not have a surprise for you. So we'll have to see. If it will do it live. You're getting it. You're getting it. I see Nuke in the chat. Nuke, I gotta, I should bring you on one of these days. Now that I know you're up this early in the morning, if you'd be game for it, we could sit here and we'll call it the anime episode where you can walk me over what's new in anime after 2003. <laughs> Cause I'm like, that's it for me. It was like, there was a period where anime I thought was interesting and good. And the stylistic choices were great. Like the, the seventies, I was kind of like, eh, but then the eighties I kicked in and the nineties kicked in. And then the 2000s, it started to lose me, and now everything is weird. Everything is weird, yeah. You could school him on Astro Boy. Dude, I forgot Astro Boy. So if you guys don't know, don't know the premise of it, Astro Boy is a pretty adult-themed kids show. Uh, this scientist, it's basically, it's like Mega Man and Dr. Wily. It's, it's, it's essentially what they are, even though they came on Earth first. But the doctor was busy working on his, on his, in his inventions. And the kid was like never being paid attention to and he's very sad. And then one day he wanted to go drive to the, the space ball game. And dad's like, whatever, I don't got time for you. And then he stops and he goes, wait a minute, kids can't drive robot cars. Kid ends up getting into an accident, dies. This is like the first two minutes of Astro Boy. And I'm like, holy Jesus, they killed a kid in a car accident because the dad wasn't paying attention. And so to, to get over his grief, he built a robot that looked just like his son named Astro Boy. And a lot of it was him yelling at his kid because he didn't know how to function in a human society. And then there's the superpowers and the fighting things there. But ultimately, it's about. I'm, you'd almost want to argue that Astro Boy is about a single dad learning to pay attention to his kids. Oh, and dude, dude, you don't want me to get me started about Akira Gundam. I was never big onto it. I think the only Gundam stuff I actually really liked was Macross Plus which I don't know if you guys remember that one. I loved Macross Plus. Fun fact, uh, Walter White was the voice of Isamu. If you can believe that, you're like, wait, the main character in a Gundam series is, is uh, Brian Cranston? It's like, yeah. Uh, okay. I guess we could do anime talk for an ever, but we're not going to. I got... I've been I've been looking through old Terrence pop videos all last night and all this morning, and I'm just beat. I'm just beat. Part of me was like, hey, you know, it'd be great. Let's talk about our dicks. <laughs> OK, fine. We'll do a little bit more. OK, let me see in here. Yeah. Grave of the Firefly is a great one for kids. Dude, that is still my favorite uh, like dunk. I always do on guys are like, oh, yeah, you got to watch this one. Grave of the Fireflies is great. And every time a guy watches it, he'll come back. He's like, F you, man. F you. Look at this. Chesty's trial is done. Congratulations, sir. Did, did Trump get out of it OK or, or did he have to pay some uh, restitutions to some porn stars? <laughs> yeah, came back to Twitter to cannibals and women avoiding old dick. Oh, dude, the cannibal thing. OK, we're banting at the beginning. I why am I even? Pretending we're going to have some red pill talk for the first 15 minutes. That is stupid. <laughs> yeah, the Haitians. 
The Haitians went from eating mud pies to eating each other. And what's the the main bad guy's name? Was it not not mosquito, not fly swatter? He had some other name like uh, barbecue, barbecue. Because a there's a bunch of cannibals there, and he has a habit of burning his victims, so they call him barbecue. <laughs> Which is I don't know. It's just something about those those any of like Africa or Haiti, like all of their little gang member names is hilarious. It kind of reminds me of that meme. In the 2000s, remember when everybody was getting all those Asian symbols on their back, like the Chinese or Japanese characters? And then the big joke was once the, the, they lose something in the translation. So when you get a native speaking Chinese or Japanese speaker, they're like, why are you saying you want to eat hot dogs all day on your neck? And you're like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. So yeah, so that's what I think of right now when they're like barbecue. Like, I guess when you got a Haitian dialect, like barbecue sounds awesome, right? It's probably close to the some Haitian word for like destroyer of worlds. <laughs> Trust but verify. See, look at his and, and nukes like rattling off things. OK, so here I'll give you an idea where I come from, though. So it was originally Astro Boy when I was like a five years old kid. It was on the reruns because I think the show was like 10 years old by the time I ever saw it. Um, and then TBS Nightflix. I don't know if you guys remember this. There was an old series. TBS Nightflix. And that was so Friday nights in Canada with a satellite dish, you had two choices. You could watch softcore porn. Or you could watch anime, and I ended up watching anime. So TBS, Netflix, I remember the little lava lamp playing. They had a back to back double feature, Vampire Hunter D and Robot Carnival. And I am surprised nobody talks about Robot Carnival because that is the movie that brought anime to the West, I would argue. It's, you know, Fantasia, Disney's Fantasia. It's Fantasia for anime. It's got all the things to it. There's no dialogue. It's perfect. And then Vampire Hunter D, which at the time I was like, this is, looks way crappier than G.I. Joe and He-Man and Mask, Outlaw Star, like all the, other anim- all the other cartoons you would see from the West. But that was the thing. They were like, how can we make this animation as cheap as possible and allow people's imaginations to get through it? And here's some little intellectual crap you want to go. Uh, what's this stupid show? N- NLP- NL- NPR? NPR in the States. For here, we call it CBC Radio 3. But uh, Marshall McLuhan, who was Jordan Peterson before Jordan Peterson, minus the whole whore of a daughter thing. He talked about, in his, in his, his work, like the medium is the message. He was talking about media literacy, that kind of thing. And this one point he made was about hot mediums and cold mediums. And I, and I promise there's a point to the end of this. I promise there's a point. And the difference was cold mediums didn't require a lot of your like full attention. And they didn't have a lot of detail. And so you had to use your imagination to fill in the blanks. Radio was a cold medium. You're listening to the guy on the radio. You have to picture the speech in your head, that sort of thing. Reading books, cold medium. You have to imagine the scene going out. You have to imagine the things go from the dialogue. Television, hot medium. You sit there, you open your eyes, you stare at it, and everything you need is coming in so you don't have to think about it. The internet used to be the coldest of mediums, and now I would argue it's it's turning, if it hasn't turned already, into a very hot medium. Now, the reason I bring that up is because of, if you ever look at Vampire Hunter D, came out in, like I think, 84 or something stupid like that. The animation is clunky. Uh, It's only like 12 frames a second. Like the whole thing is about is really juvenile looking. But the thing that I like about it, other than as a stylistic choice, I do like 80s anime for its style. It has its own it has its own vibe. But it, it functioned more, even though it was television, it functioned more as a cold medium. Like your brain had to fill in a lot of blanks, which made it arguably a more enjoyable experience. And I think that kind of died off once they started adding CGI to anime. I think like we've come a long way since Golgo 13 had that green screen uh, wireframe chopper coming at you. Oh, yeah, the whole thing was. And that's why when you look at things like Vaporwave, City Pop, a bunch of these very new age retro musical genres that are coming out. New one I just found out about, which I kind of knew, but I didn't know the name of Barbercore. Or Barber Beats. Haircuts for Men. I was like, holy shit. That's awesome. I love Haircuts for Men. 
And yeah, the Japan was going through the 80s, but Japan had a great cultural zeitgeist because a lot of their stuff from the 50s, 60s and 70s was because everybody survived the Second World War. And that's where you get things like Godzilla, um, Ultraman. It was always about world destroying events because they had just gone through, which was about as close as any human as it being has ever come to an apocalypse. And that that totally changed their game and their, their their thing. And that's how they like they invented ramen because they were super poor. And they're like, how can we get food into as many people as possible? Because we have no food. Americans gave us some. They gave us like craft cheese. They gave us wheat and they gave us corn. And they turned into ramen. And you're like, oh, bless these people. Godzilla was there for like post. Godzilla was to Japan what Dadaism is to Europe. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's an art style that came out of the 18th and or 19th century. Yeah, around World War One, because of the mustard gas, everybody was going all crazy. A lot of art just had like an effort style. And this is where surrealism actually was born out of. So guys like Max Ernst, Salvador Dali and such, they used to be classically trained painters, and then they went to data. And if you look at data, it's like when people crap on how they hate modern art, for the most part, they're noticing it's data. Punk stole a lot from data. If you watch a lot of like the old Sex Pistols and and their type of aesthetic, a lot of that was taken from dataism. It really is like a but then but in Japan, they were like, no, we're going to make Godzilla. So they, in that way, they're better than us. And then, yeah, in the 80s. Everything was on the up and up, economically prosperous. And so everything had like a more um, upward, upward vibe to it. And that's where anime got big and that sort of thing. Anyways, so we're on, we're on new animes. Anyways, that's where you got stuff like Robot Carnival, uh, Vampire Hunter D. What was another good one out of the series? Eight Man After, which I'm pretty sure I want to say Mark Hamill did either the voice acting for it or he did the live action series afterwards. I cannot remember. Uh, Mad Bull, the Street Fighter anime. That was the second coming of Christ for anime fans in the West because, oh, and heaven forbid, if you ever got the red box, man, there was a blue box one, which was like no violence, no nudity. And then there was the yellow box one, which had the. I think the yellow box one had the part where Sagat got the dragon uppercut from Ryu. And blood was shooting out everywhere. And then there was the blue box, if I'm not mistaken. Or no, the red box, which had that and a Chun-Li shower scene. And as like a 13-year-old kid, you were here for it, man. There was many Street Fighter animes, but the Street Fighter, the animated video was awesome. Like to date, to date, I don't think there is a better anime um, fight scene in anything than the Chun-Li versus Vega fight. At one point, she throws a sofa at him, kicks him through a wall. KM FDM is blasting in the background. And if you don't know German existentialist metal and industrial, oh, you've been missing out. KM FDM is awesome. Yeah, and then Akira. Akira Teens game. So there's all that stuff. And then Wicked City. Uh, that was another one I was a big fan of. Ninja Scroll. I mean, how can you not love Ninja Scroll? And then there's always Trigun, Cowboy Bebop, which is, I think it's when Clary started watching was by Cowboy Bebop. Bubblegum Crisis, I should have got into it, but I never did. It was that, it was it Sahu? The, where they look more like childlike, but it's a very adult-like themes. Uh, Couch, Mechin, Vegeta, best anime character in my opinion. See, that was the thing, though. Dragon Ball Z, it just never hit. It never hit for me. I, don't, I, I think I was in the right time to start watching the first Dragon Ball, but I don't know, I had Astro Boy, and I was just like, eh, I just don't, just never hit me. So we'll see. Yeah, I never got into Dragon Ball Z either. There's a bunch of them. It's, you know what it was? I think it was because that was the time where I was watching Power Rangers. I think it's like that Elvis and the Beatles thing. Like, you could be fans of both, but you're ultimately a, a Beatles man or a, or a Elvis man. And for me, it's like you're either Dragon Ball Z or you're Power Rangers. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Too bad my journey's similar to Goku's. Yeah, yeah. So the funny thing, the funny thing about this, I guess we'll tie this back to Red Pill because I mean we're here, and this is literally the only reason I have a job right now is to talk about this stuff. So like this nostalgia is good, and the entertainment is good, and it always comes at the end of work. Like if you have something better to do, go do it. If you have nothing to do, unapologetically do what you want. Like I am amazed how many women hate the idea of a man with free time you know 
if you've been in a relationship, even Bill Burr used to have jokes about that. It's like, oh, an empty schedule? Let's fill it with shit. And you're like, Jesus, man. I don't think they understand the idea of, and I'm pretty sure it's an introvert thing. In fact, I'm almost positive it's an introvert thing. Because I remember it's, and everybody always confuses introvert, introversion with socially awkward or socially absent, which is not the case at all. That's the, that's the biggest misconception about introverts, introverts and extroverts. The best way to describe it without getting all nerdy about it and abstract is extroverts get hyped from social interaction and introverts kind of like, it's like a battery. You just, it just, it wears. And the reason I know this, I was an introvert is because I used to have like, I remember after our deployment to be at my house, I had my swank bachelor pad and we had 20 to 30 sailors at a time, a bunch of chicks from the bar. And I would always have like giant parties at my house, like three days a week. We had three months off of work. We had $50,000 of cash just sitting around. I had just bought my place. I had an Italian, a 12 foot Italian leather sectional sofa, which, oh my God, the love sofa was awesome. Uh, my whole house was painting in like a color called ice tea, which was like a bright orange. My buddy helped me build. We built a cedar cedar patio outside of it. We had like my giant Zen garden, which you'd never think guys in gardening guys in their twenties were gardening, but oh my God, I remember this at police school. We're sitting there talking and every guy had a garden and it's cause yeah, cause this is stressful as shit. And so what do I do when I go home? I play modern warfare too. And I work on my garden. And that was it. And that's when I realized, like, yeah, we do need our winding down time. So during these parties, like right in the middle, I think I was even dating my girl at the time. But uh, like right in the middle of the party, I would just disappear. She's like, what the hell? Where'd he go? And then she goes, sneaks in the bedroom and she, like I'm in there and the lights are off. I'm just sitting here quietly. The lights are off. And I think SimCity 4 is on the TV. I had a TV in my bedroom with the computer hooked up to it. And she's like, what are you doing? You have a party. There's a ton of people out there. And you're sitting in here playing SimCity 4 with the lights out quietly. I'm like, just give me five minutes. <laughs> just five minutes. And then five minutes later, you're out there still going. And yeah. So, uh, gardening. Is that why my fingernails are worn down to the up? No, that would be the car accident, sir. The car accident and the dog bite. My damn dog bit off my nail and then had to get dental surgery three months later. Not related, but it was already on the docket. So he bit through my nail, my whole thumb fell off, and it's slowly been healing over the past six months. And then we had to get some dental work, and now he's down to like three teeth. It's like a hole punch, man. Have you ever you ever tried getting bit by a hole punch? It's not fun. Yeah, a lot of that. And it's it's one of those things, and this is one of those easy boundaries that guys never, never even think about, where it's just like, carve out your free time. Like they always have this idea that a hundred percent of your time has to be productive. 100% of your time has to be, you know, earning money. Well, the kids are going to die. The wife is, you know, needs a new coat, all this shit. And they fall for it because they get shamed into it. It's like that human sock puppet quote I talked to you guys about. I've, I've mentioned a bunch of times, like, you are a man. You're the only one on this worth fit to, fit to do anything of any worth. And that's why everybody's going to twist your arm by force or by coercion to get you to do what they want to do. And your point is to learn what you want to do. I, I really should pull up the quote when I do it because I have not got it memorized yet and I always butcher it, but you get the point. I wouldn't even say it's not even so much enjoying the fruits of your labor. It's work hard, play hard. It's one of those things from the military. When in doubt, rack out, work out, play, work hard, play hard. It was the most amazing thing. And even today, my girl's like, I can't, she has trouble sleeping or whatever. She, you just lay down and you're sleeping. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> why is that? Because I've gone places before where I had trouble sleeping. And then like two hours later, it didn't matter. I got to go to work. And that was probably one of the roughest days. You guys do not know a rough day until you've been out drinking and partying and not sleeping. And then in San Diego and first thing in the morning, have to put on your polyester double breasted suit in or no in november and go do a parade out on the pier while you're watching guys to the left and the right of you dropping dropping like flies and you're drunk on guinness so you got a massive headache as well you're dehydrated as hell and then after that you have to go into and do a full work day and it's not like oh just show up and yeah can i help you with that and ring it in it's like no you've got a thousand communications to headquarters you got to put in. And if you make a mistake on that, it's going to cause a national incident. So you got to double check your stuff. Yeah, fuck trad cons, dude. 
nonstop Dre, thank you for the $2 super chat, but fuck those guys. Honestly, they've done nothing. Look, they've done less than nothing in the, I would argue they haven't really been making themselves known in the red pill space until probably last year. And there's cycles to it too. It's happened before. Jordan Peterson brought in a bunch too, but they've done nothing but make bitchy broads and simpish men and a, an a army of first name bunch of numbers idiots just run in their mouth. Largely just to get these people out of my feed. I just went private. I'm like, you know what? I'm not making money off of Twitter. And the growth is like, it's moderate, but it's mostly just people that are hate following anyway. So I'm just going to go private. Been the greatest experience ever. Every time I see one of you guys and I'm like, oh, you're doing what I did. You're yelling at first name bunch of numbers for being a twat. But then I realized that's all we're talking about is how much of a twat first name bunch of numbers is. And then I'm like, are these even people? I don't think they are. I think they're Southeast Asian bot farmers and shit like that. But yeah, introverts. Work hard, play hard. And there's cases like you bust your ass, right? I had a six week sale here. It was TJX, task group exercise. Every fall, we'd have those where we go down to Diego. And it was mostly just board games. We'd run through a bunch of training stuff. We'd have like a fighting exercise. The Americans, by the way, you've never seen I like I don't even know what the word for it would be. I want to say irony, but it's not ironic. It's more just funny. It's just entertaining to see about a billion dollars in capital equipment, capital expenditures, um, a couple like ten million dollars of operational expenditures, the equivalent of two of a bunch of friends out in the woods playing with sticks nailed together to look like guns, arguing over who hit who with what bullet. That is a task group exercise to a T. Everybody and like everybody has their little stories, right? Canada's like, oh, there was the thing. Our our destroyer took out the aircraft carrier. Our subs take out the aircraft carrier. We're always we punch above our weight. We're the sp- sp- plunky little upstarts. And America's like, yeah, no. And then you, you have to call on the radio G- golf, golf, golf or Mike, Mike, Mike for guns or missiles or tango for torpedoes and. They just wouldn't respond. They're like, well, they didn't respond, so you didn't hit us. And we're like, we did a clean sweep. We even hoisted the broom on this thing, you motherfucker. And they're like, yeah, no. Like, All right, whatever. And then you realize, like, no, we got him. We got him. Canada, to be fair, though, we were pretty clever. So a lot of stuff we did, especially for sub hunting. Oh, my God, our sub hunting was fun. Uh, one thing that we were kind of known for was... So submarines can kind of detect what kind of ship it is based on how their engine sounds at certain frequencies, the amount of volume on the ship. And everybody would try to go really quiet to minimize that. But we did the we would do the opposite thing. We would make a ton of noise. We'd have a banyan. A banyan's like a barbecue right there, right? And then the idea is when a submariner, when a, the, the acoustics guy would listen to that, he's like, what the hell? And it, they, we, they would mistake us for a fishing barge or a booze cruise, or anything like that. So they wouldn't think of us as a military ship. It's like, no military ship has a party. And then they'd move on, and then we would take that opportunity to hunt them. So it was pretty funny. I mean, it's clever. It's a bit risky, but clever. I always question if Wargame results were truthful, above board, or just loser talk. I mean, from our standpoint, my one of my jobs on the bri- as a bridge watchkeeper was to log all of this stuff. So I had the logs. And the tactical dies down below had all the tactical stuff. It was really mostly like officers for the after action reports and and for their and for their stuff. They would obviously like twist the things to make them look good. But if you look at the operators and the tech te- te- tech people, the, the thing went out pretty much as expected. But yeah, the Americans never fought fair, which I guess is kind of the American tactical thing anyway, right? Hell, I probably sunk nuclear Cardio at least once or twice. <laughs> he and Hunter going down, sirs. But I get back from this and it's like, and I, th- I think I even did a sub stack on this one. I remember at the time I was dating my girl. It wasn't long. She was a plate. I had a few plates at the time. I think two, maybe three. Yeah, there was her. There was the dog walker. And then there was the stripper. Or it could have been somebody else. You know what? I love that when like you can't even remember anymore. Anyways, the point of the story is. I got home from the sale. It was six weeks, ball busting, bag drive. I was tired. I was exhausted. I just wanted to sit in my bathrobe all day, drink Corona 
and play Modern Warfare 2. And she calls up and she's like, hey, there's a great festival happening right now and a farmer's market and it's like a thing and I go to it every year and we should go. And I just I thought about like I think about it now at the time I was just like, uh, no, I got to work. And then I sat down and I'm just like start teabagging people and I'm like, all right, whatever. But I thought about it now and I'm like, how many guys would have felt obliged? Well, she wants to go. We should go. Well, we have sex, so we should go or I'll lose the sex. If I turn her down for this, she's going to break up with me. You know, oh, it's the mother of my children. I better do it. How many guys end up just rubbing themselves down to a nub because they're afraid to they're afraid to say no, not even to their wives, their girlfriends, their dates, their plates. It's like, Jesus. <laughs> a party, a party boat with no hot chicks, Navy ship. Yeah. Having said that is something is rather funny about a dude playing the acoustic guitar with uh, leaning on a 50 cal. <laughs> it's just it's just it's just interesting. Knowing that if they call if they call action stations, just to get up on that thing and, and load up. I miss the fi <laughs> and this is the other this is such a Canadian thing, but I think Americans will appreciate this. So I'm only qualified. Like I've only ever used three different weapons. I I know uh I said a SIG P two seventy seven or two twenty seven. I can operate a SIG. I can't field strip it. I mean I'm sure I could learn, but I just don't know how yet. A C seven or the AR platform stuff. That's you know C seven C eight M four M sixteen. They're all basically the same, just different barrel lengths and that. I can work that pretty well. And then the third weapon I'm, I actually know how to use and operate is a is a bear. <laughs> it's a it's a 50 cal. So basically, if Mish ever brought his Toyota out of retirement and he had his 50 cal stapled onto the thing at that point, I could probably run that. We could sit here, and pull our own version of uh, ISIL. I just think it's funny because you got Americans, you guys are very up to date on the types of guns and the purpose of guns. And there's always very strong opinions on this won't help you when the when the zombies come over the hill and oh the Democrats don't go, go down to they need American. <laughs> and you're like, all right. What can you run? I can use a pistol and I can use a 50 cal. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> yeah, man, go hard, go hard or go home. <laughs> it's introverts. That's the funny thing. And it's just guys are afraid. And here's the thing. How many guys are chronically sleep deprived because they're afraid to say no to their wives? You know, let's say. And I know everybody makes fun of, oh, you're just sending emails at your job. Well, I don't know if you guys know this, but if you've ever had one of them email jobs, and I have, those are probably, I would argue that that was more mentally draining to me than a deployment schedule. Don't get me wrong. Deployments, physically exhausting. You are sleep deprived. You're always on. Your adrenaline's going. You will burn out. But the email jobs are something different. It's something where it's just like it requires enough of your attention at all times. Without any feedback mechanisms like, you know, for a guy, you like working on something, you finish something like Chesty was just talking today, finished the trial, got to go home. And now I hear about this crap. But like the trial is over. There's a process. There's a start. There's a finish. There's a sense. I would hope there's a sense of accomplishment to it. Military at least had that email jobs there's never a sense of accomplishment the work is non-ending there is no defined start and end points to something yes there's occasionally projects but even then a project never really ends it just transitions into its different life cycle phase it goes from the rfp rfc phase into like a, a maintenance phase into a a, a winding down phase and it, nothing's ever done and no, nobody wants it to be done because as soon as things are done they have to be accountable for the results so i never i never bought into this whole like sunk a stay at home mom is like oh you just sent emails all day you need to help me with the kids it's like fuck you so yeah i guess that's one of those funny things about boundaries everybody joins the red pill they think oh this is great i'll get laid and women ain't shit and she belongs to the streets like that's great but no offense to myron but if he doesn't have the ability to stand up to a little bit of scrutiny about wanting a boxing career He's going to have a hard as hell time when a girl eventually tries to settle down with him saying, hey, I know you're burnt out from yelling at White Claw chicks all day, but we should go to the we should go to the farmer's market tomorrow. And he's burnt out. I mean, I, I shouldn't even shit on farmer's markets. I, I went to one yesterday and I actually kind of enjoyed myself. So it's not those. It's just that's what I pick. That's what's most recent in my mind. Uh, Dr. Ravage, five dollar super chat. Thank you very much, sir. Finally catching you live. So here's one heartfelt just cause fellow Kanakistan. Oh, my God. 
not only is he Canadian, not only is he breaking the new, uh, the new Canadian broadcast regulations for internet speak, that's racist, by the way, <laughs> and he wants a heartfelt fuck you. <laughs> My God. Yeah, they can be. They can be. It's not so much that, though. It's about a guy being able to be in control of your own time. One of those boundary things that guys never think about. And to be fair, it's because a lot of the dialogue that happens on this is single guys online talking about sex in the abstract. Like, if you've never settled down with a woman before for any length of time, you're not going to know that. You're never going to know, hey, what's the, what's the biggest problem you have right now? Well, A, I can never have free time without being filled with stuff or attention needing. B, the sex life, and C, she needs to stop yelling at the kids. Those three things, single guys can maybe guess at the one. And that's only because any guy who's in a marriage not getting laid is constantly bitching about it to anybody who will listen. So that's the only thing you know about. And that's another reason why I completely cannot stand the red pill. <laughs> that's why the red pill is trash. That's their real problem. Because they never, yeah, you won't find any upset guns in the market. <laughs> Well, I mean, they're not upset at the time because they got what they wanted. <laughs> yeah, there's this nice one. It's actually it's like two hours out of town. And the thing I like about it is the, the meat section. Like I got a giant a kilogram of like Polish sausage for 10 bucks. I was like, Jesus, in Canada, that's unheard of, by the way. It should be like triple that. And then like I've got about eight links of chorizo in the fridge. I would have got more, but again, we live in the city. So for us, it's never about cost. For us, the concern is always about space. Yeah, Amish Butchers too. Montreal had a great place, Sammy Foods. They had uh, an Islamic butcher, if I'm not mistaken. I think they were Islamic. Some of the best cuts of meat ever. And they all sometimes had different names for things. But if you knew what you were looking for, you could always find it. And the meat was like dirt cheap. It was awesome. Yeah, Polish. Well, what can I say? I was I was born in, and raised in Alberta. So if you're not into like Polish and Ukrainian food, then what the hell are you doing in Alberta? And then chorizo, which my girl were arguing is like, is that Mexican or Spanish? I thought it was Spanish. She says it's Mexican. So, you know, we'll let we'll let everybody else decide. Anyways, introverts carving out your time, I think. And I don't know what it is. I know part of it is a lot of guys don't even acknowledge introversion because everybody's got that idea that introvert means you're a neat, you're socially awkward. Introverts are the guys that can't look you in the eye when they're talking to you and have a conversation. It's like, it's not true at all. I always refer to it as uh, being an introvert, and I know I've already did the definition thing, but I've always referred to it as being an introvert is, is, and social is like being good at a job you don't like. Same thing. I'm not a social guy. My buddy, my best buddy, he's he's an extrovert. When he's finally finished all of his work, he's got nothing else to do. He's like, hey, I should call. I should call. I should call Ryan and chit chat and talk about what's been new. Calls me up. Hey, how's it going, man? Um, dog drops. Uh, when I get through all this stuff, then my thought is, man, I just need to sit down and like stare at a wall or turn on Dwarf Fortress or Minecraft or something and unwind. So. No, no, no. I have real friends in real life as well as like online friends. Although I guess we have met Chesty, so we are we are buddies now. I think it's fair enough to say. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that you don't like it, but it is draining. Exactly. It's draining. So this is one of those things that I don't think extroverts have ever learned about how to how to carve your time in the same way, because when a girl starts trying to fill it with extroversion stuff. Sounds like a blast. Maybe it is a lot of fun. Maybe they truly enjoy having their girl fill their schedule all the time. I don't know. I am amazed, though, out of all the all the the lessons and the mental models and the red pill stuff you teach guys. Some of the simplest stuff is the ones that they have the hardest time with. It's mostly because they don't really associate A with B. Like to this day, I still one of my favorite things about being here in this space is when you see a guy have an epiphany where it's just something simple. Like she's not yours. It's just your turn or any of those witty platitudes. We always throw out that everybody's completely ignored the meaning of and like, yeah, it was crazy. My wife was talking about some argument and I just said no. And then she threatened divorce and to take the kids. 
And I'm just like, and I thought to myself, I'm like, man, it's like, I guess this time is over and that's fine with me. So don't hit your ass on the door. And then they'll go through this whole explanation. I'm like, oh, so basically she's not yours. It's just your turn. And then you always, you have that, like that pregnant pause where the guy's like, oh yeah, I love that shit, man. I really do. Yeah, Depeche Mode, which is funny because like uh, the Ava Adore album from the Smashing Pumpkins, huge Depeche Mode inspiration. So I've never listened to them, but I've listened to the people that were inspired by them. Which is funny because I guess Siamese Dream was a lot of it was built by Rush. Anyways, we're off topic here. Um, yeah, watching that click moment and I realized there's there's two levels to to this stuff. There's the intellectual level and there's the emotional level. That's kind of what inspired the me to expand on the tetrahedron, which I can't take credit for it. I want to say it was Scorch Zang who did, or maybe Yui McGill. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, so for you guys, like, I can sit here. What is this? This thumbnail's numbered 162, and I think there was 100 episodes before that on a different set of thumbnail format. But we can sit here, and I can tell you, you know, whaminate shit. I can say a Walt. I can talk about the bell curve and all this stuff. And, like, and then you get it. You're not stupid. You guys get it. You, I mean, you have good memes, so of course you understand things. You're not stupid. But there's fundamentally, and this is why that line I put in frame, where ultimately I don't think a guy can have frame until he's been in a relationship, because it's just not tested with somebody that you have an emotional, I don't want to say vulnerability, I guess investment, emotional investment with. Until you have that level of testing on you, it's, it's hard to, to know truly that you have frame. It's very easy to have frame when you're single. Cause there's nothing to, <laughs> there's no, there's no pressure one way or the other, you know? Yeah. And then it, it happens and I love when it happens and it's, it's always the same way. It's never somebody explaining the thing. It's always somebody explaining it. Like they reinvented the wheel, which I prefer honestly. And I'm not even shitting on it. I think it's great. I think when guys figure something out after running through the mental models and all the work in here, and then they, they have to get that extra connection between the two. I think that's when somebody truly gets red pilled. I really do. And that's why I laugh. It's all oh, the red pill dudes do this and the red pill dudes do that. And you're like, oh, for fuck's sake, really? And you can tell it's somebody that doesn't get it. They don't know. They just can't call. So in fairness, uh, it's, it's really convenient now for a lot of those type of people to call to blame everything on red pill dudes because you can't blame them on minorities anymore because that's racist. And you know, we're not racist. And you can't blame it on all men are trash anymore because they're trying to get men because they're 28 in the epiphany phase. So when you blame it on the red pill dudes, that's like the easiest demographic to shit on that has no pull to affect your life socially out there. So it's like, why wouldn't you? Can't shit on the do dog damn Democrats because they're for abortion. You can't sit on the shit on the Republicans because they want you to end up and marry those hoes. So red pill dudes get it. We'll, we'll take that for you. We are not. What does is, what is, uh, Nuke always say? We are. I am not a good person. I am not a good person. Yeah, you need somebody to know and weaponize your faults to really test your frame. Dude, I like that. I'm stealing that line, actually. And it's funny, too. Okay, I'm tweeting that line. That's how I remember it. Is he tweeting while he's on his live stream? Shut up. I don't go to your work and slap the dicks out of your mouth. Um, yeah, one more, please. Funny, fun fact. He's arguably, at least anybody who's been in like the married red pill space argued he probably had the best frame out of, out of anybody in there. And he's got a whole story to it. We can get into that. But I mean, I'm, that's his story to tell. It's not mine. Are you a really a red pill dude? If you get upset that people are blaming shit on red pill boogeymen? Yeah. Oh, and that's the thing. There's two things to it. So there's like, are you actually getting mad? Or is this performative theatric anger? I'd argue most of it's just performative theatrics if you're like a larger brand, because like Rolo doesn't give a shit about this stuff. I don't give a shit. I'd argue Rolo cares more about how they're ruining Christianity than they're trying to ruin Red Pill, which fair. And for me, I'm like, hey, you guys love it when I shit on people because it's funny. So, all right. These fucking broads. Eh. Tip your waitress. Jazz hands. Yeah, how do you spot one in public? But that's the thing, Duke. Like, we've had, I've had this conversation, and other people have had it for, like, going on 10 years now. Before Twitter, there was Purple Pill Debate. Before then, there was, like, 
all kinds of the the blogosphere used to have there's like five different blogs that used to bitch all the time about manosphere stuff and then they would do their own blogs because you'd always see when you go through an old Roycey or an old uh dalrock blog where they're like well this broad in this blog and those chick blogs are always long gone they're always just like an empty 404 space they made fun of men for this and that and you realize it's the same thing that you see now but instead of a tweet it's at least 500 words in an essay of course, most of it's just filled with babble. And if you don't know what I mean, go on to TikTok. And if you ever find yourself in middle-aged soccer mom TikTok, like the women have figured out TikTok is a great reason to bitch about everything. And you watch them tell their story. And it's crazy because in a three-minute TikTok video, two minutes, two minutes of it is filled with words that don't impart any useful information just ama- it's just amazing to watch i wish i could run out the clock like that and that's when i when i see all these stupid uh what does rollo call it when they're on the debates and they oh filibuster yeah they filibuster their time like a uh, ruslan whoever that i still don't know which one ruslan is is he the one with the pool table jacket i can't remember and that guy he just had on tim pool same thing and you're just like holy jesus christ like if you babble enough or what's it, what's your plan here if you babble enough oh and then you just say christ is king at the end so just hit the catchphrase, hit the catchphrase, and you're good. Uh, I was in Playa with my eight-year-old daughter. She shopkeep was still trying to sell me weed and coke. I still go hard. <laughs> oh, dude, I'm not going to lie. I missed this. Speaking of things I've missed, like the way Astro Boy to me is booze and Dragon Ball Z to me is weed. Like, I get it. I get it. Everybody loves it. And in Canada, it's legal now, but. I remember when I left the military, I was like, you can't tell me what to do. And I, and I, I feel like for the second time in my life, I'm like, all right, let's, let's go. And I was just like, this just puts me to sleep, man. I don't like it at all. <laughs> I think it's one of those things that you have to get into when you're 13 or it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't hit right. So maybe, I don't know. Yeah. DBZ is crown apple. Oh, you're drinking crown apple. Nuke. Nuke. I, I know in the States, it probably sounds cooler, but like, if you're going to tell somebody you're drinking crown apple, you might as well just say how, how good your sister tastes. It's like, what the hell, man? Yeah, don't ever don't ever talk about Canadian club or crown royal to a Canadian because we kind of like it's laughable. It's like, oh, bro, like or Molson export. Like, dude, that's the stuff that we get rid of because nobody will drink it. Like, don't do that. He doesn't like being misunderstood. Low patience combined with mild tism. Oh, yeah. Okay, Hafiz was the pool table jacket guy. I've never heard of Ruslan. I still don't know who these people are. Like, I know the names, but if somebody showed me a photo, I'm like, who's this? And they're like, that's that Ruslan you were making fun of. I'm like, oh, that's the guy? That makes so much sense. Aussies don't drink Fosters. Yeah, I can see that too. Makes total friend. Makes total sense. So I guess the whole point of this, I didn't really have a point. It was kind of meandering. But yeah, it is really. It's about carving back your time. And everybody keeps thinking about all the big stuff, right? Like the paternity fraud. Because you know what? It's big. It's ostentatious. It grabs clicks. And and chicks love to bitch about paternity fraud. And I've engaged in a little bit of it myself. The whole, that's the, that's the ranting right now. Some dude on Reddit made up a story about how he asked his wife for a paternity test on his kid. And now she won't talk to him. And all these girls are sitting here. It's like, oh. She may not leave him today, but she's definitely checked out of the marriage. And this guy's a monster. And these red pill dudes are this. And these red pill dudes are that. And I'm like, well, first off, did anybody even bother to understand what the hell they're talking about? Because the MGTOWs just goof around with like paternity fraud. A third of men are out there with like cucked kids. And it's like, that's not what it says at all. If you actually, if you actually read what, and it's not even statistics. If it was statistics, I would just shit on it wholesale. But it's, they collect the information from, uh, family courts on this on people that thought there was paternity fraud or how many cases are being done so it's mostly a numbers thing and it was for when men had enough of a suspicion about the paternity of their kid they would actually go get a dna test done it was about one in three 33 percent give or take which is a different thing so that's saying if you have doubts you have a one in three chance of being right which is a much more somber and I don't want to say it's minimizing it, but it does put it in its proper context. It's saying our gut instinct 
is right maybe a third of the time, but 30% is pretty big. 30% is pretty big. So yeah, if you have doubts, absolutely get one. If you don't have any doubts, you're probably fine. Of course, then there's the whole, well, the girl will get mad. And that's all to ultimately what it boils down to. She won't like it when you do that. She won't love you anymore and she'll leave you. It's like, first off, who cares? Think about this. You're already at the point where you're like, I wonder if she's cheating on me. And now you're wondering like, oh, but how do I keep her? And how do I, how do I ultimately guys just want to not know? Like, how can I set up a perfect set of lies for me to believe what I want to believe in this situation? If you were truly worried about paternity there and she's willing to break up with you over it. How much do you care? You know what I mean? You have to care enough. If you don't care enough for an ass whooping, you don't care. It's just it's just the way it is. Yeah, uh, and, and chest rate to 23 and me is hilarious. The number of half brothers and sisters have killed adult relationships between parents and kids. There's. And then I guess the big question is, why are you using one process over the other? So I know if you get one of those like official genetic tests through the court system, there's a whole bunch of things through there. But does it really matter? I think a lot of guys that do that, too, they just want an authority to tell them, well, it's not your kid, so you have to break up with her. So that way it's not my fault, right? Oh, it's not my fault. I, I didn't. The court said it said it's not mine. And so by by the the Mori Povich law of 2003, I'm required to do dance a jig and then leave. Like, oh, come on. You could easily just get a 23 and me thing done and it'll tell you, oh, yeah, this one's your kid or this one's not your kid. Or there's like a 4% chance if you have doubts. And then you just do what you want anyway. You know what the best part of this is, is that you don't need permission. You don't need permission to leave your cheating whore wife. You don't. You don't have to ask anybody. The feminists did a really good job. And the courts, because they're so overburdened right now, did a really good job passing that off to everybody else to be like, you know what? Let's not worry about fault. Let's just separate assets and whatever. So if you find out if the, if the object is to find out if you're being taken advantage of or not. Just go get one of those cheap ones. Honey, why are you putting a Q-tip in the baby's mouth? Shh. Yeah, the bigger issue is most men can't handle their woman being upset. Exactly. Stop bitching. This is not the thing to be upset about. And that's kind of where I'm getting with this too, Winemore. Guys are terrified. They keep talking about how manly they are, but they're ultimately terrified of a wee little girl. Girl will never beat you in a fight, but you're terrified of her. Not even fighting you, just for not fighting you, for leaving you, for not talking to you. Oh, dude, the amount of girls that can get what they want from a man just by not talking to them. This is ultimately, I would argue this is one of those, those great tests between a guy who gets it and a guy who doesn't. It's how they react to their girl ignoring them. A guy who gets it turns it into a fishing trip. This is great. I'm going to read a book. <laughs> She's ignoring me. And then the guy who doesn't constantly like, hey, hey, love me. Please tell me why you're mad so I can fix it and you can stop being angry. Let me take control of your emotions. It's not manipulative. I just want to change everything you do, you think, and you say in a way that allows you to love me more. Not manipulation. It's just great. Follow my Gumroad course on how to how to turn her into your slut. <laughs> oh, I don't mean to shit on these guys. Whatever. Can't handle a temper tantrum from your woman. How can you expect men to lead in politics, culture, and society? Well, I mean, I don't even go there. I don't even go there. Because a lot of, like, mentally defective people get into that stuff but the question is i go under the assumption that you and i will never be in that position where we make a fundamental change to our societies we just don't like right now the best i can hope for is people see people reading my books out in public which blew my mind it's happened i think three times now and people dm me to like hey just so you know i was like walking around in wappity splash city or sitting down in this store here and I saw somebody reading fuck files. I saw somebody reading dread and I'm like, holy shit. That's fucking amazing. Like to me, the stuff is this stuff still isn't real. Like this isn't real. This, I'm staring at a little box and I'm staring at my own goofy mug with these ridiculous shades on. And then I'm staring over here at a bunch of text with a Tyler Durden photo on it and <laughs> James Spader. So I'm sitting here talking with Edward Norton, James Spader, uh, the neck of a brown man in a suit. And then a bunch of anime PFPs. Like, do you expect me to sit here and be like, well, this is, this is serious work. We're saving lives. It's like, at some point, you just have to take a step back from yourself and like absorb the entirety of what's going on. <laughs> How can you not laugh, man? 
How could you not laugh? And then I'm like, I have to sit here and be like, well, what about that chick with her tits hanging out that said men are bad? I'm like, she didn't bring out the nip. Why am I supposed to listen? Back in the day, in the 80s and 90s, when a girl wanted to talk to you, they got topless. And then they had your attention. And they could fill in all kinds of stuff. Yeah, when my ex would silent treatment ignore me, I used to love that. It was like low-key being rewarded for not giving her her way. Yeah. And it's, 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 a lot of guys think of it as like some Machiavellian plan that girls do. It's like, this is how she's gonna, she's planning for this. And it's like, this will make them work. It's not that at all, really. It's more just instinct and habit. Like a quick scenario, girl gets mad at you and she's so mad she can't even talk because she can't form words. And then she goes into the bedroom, hides for a minute. And then you come in and start trying to coddle her. Whether you know it or not, what you've just said, what you've just communicated to her limbic brain is when you get in this state of mind, the man comes over and acquiesces to your demands. So the next time she wants something, her body has that neurological conditioning to be like, oh, why don't you, have you thought about having a temper tantrum and storming off into the bedroom? And it works again. And you're like, holy fuck. Every time you reward that bad behavior, it becomes a thing. The only problem I have with that statement too, the reward good behavior, don't reward bad behavior, is that the ultimate, the term reward is so easily used as a container word that I think guys misinterpret it. They think, oh, I bought her flowers because, you know, she was having more sex. And they're like, why won't she have sex anymore? It's like, well, you're not rewarding her. Buying her flowers is for, like, buying somebody a gift is, is a reward for yourself. A gift is something for you. Make you feel better. Whitemore has a great article in that one, too. Why your gratitude is useless. For the most time, it's about the speaker. I don't think women even notice it's nagging. I really don't. I don't think they do. I think they're just talking and they don't realize they're at a loud voice and they don't realize it's all commands. I think you'd have to like record the conversation and play it back later and have some third party listen and tell them that, yeah, that sounds like nagging for that to kick in. And I'm not going through all that crap because what does it matter? What do I need third party to agree with this for? It's like, no, just shush. Uh, nonstop Dre, $2 super chat. Couch, my fans can actually read. I'm shocked. <laughs> it's not that they can't. It's that they don't. I, I, I don't know what percentage of guys. I know there's, it's, it's bigger than zero. A percentage of guys that buy the books, not because they like the books, not because they want to read the books, not because I'm a good author, but because they want to support the, the cause. I get it. Everybody does. Oh, speaking of which, where'd I put it? Speaking of the cause, I got this in the mail today. Dr. Seeger finally finished it. Uncommon cold, the science and experience of cold plunge therapy. The guy who actually talked me out of like cold showers are being stupid. Although for him, immersion therapy and cold showers are totally different things. But yeah, Ryan, this book wouldn't be here right now if not for your encouragement and wisdom. Thank you for sharing your experience and helping me along, especially when I needed it most, Thomas Seeger. I'm adding this one to the shelf. I have to give it a read still. It's on my list. I have two more books on the queue right now, but I'm going to be on there. But it's nice. I love, and don't get me wrong, boy, boy did some work. I'm looking through this thing. I actually enjoy how he's done his best to make it look like a textbook and all of his uh, aesthetic choices kind of went that direction. So like, this is the kind of thing you would see that you would want to go back and do research. You'd have to go to like specific pages and that. So anyways, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I found out about float therapy down in Florida. Any of you guys try it? I've heard about that. It's, it's kind of similar to, uh, what do they call it? The sensory deprivation stuff, right? But it's just the idea of floating. It takes all the stress off of all of your your things. Like I know a friend of mine, she's a vet tech, and they often do that when dogs get arthritis and that. So they'll put them on float therapy or if they need to lose weight and they're too heavy for their joints. If we're talking about the same thing anyway. <laughs> Doobie, I feel more alpha already. I mean, you are what you do, right? Not what you read. Yeah, exactly. Just do something quiet in an empty room. You know what's funny too? I think that's because it's like the whole point of meditation was that. It's just, have you ever just sat quietly, relaxed, let yourself get bored? Not many people do. I don't do it nearly as much, not as much as I should. And I think that's one of those things where science is kind of catching up to, to meditation, but what do I know, right? 
if I had to say the same thing for me, it's I just like mundane tasks, some little focus thing. And that's kind of that, those other meditations, like those sand painting ones, where you focus on some minute task that you don't have to worry about to kind of keep, let your mind wander. I'd argue that's what like a lot of the video games I play kind of are. I fall instantly asleep if I attempt to meditate. Hey, when in doubt, rack out. Well, lifting weights is a form of meditation. This is what I mean. Like there's this underlying thing where as a guy, it's sometimes good to do nothing. Nothing. Let your mind wander. Let your mind get bored. And there's also something to be said for doing a very simple task that requires a lot of focus. So that way you don't have to be neurotic about all the shit around you. Right. It like trains you to not be neurotic and think about the future and just focus on the present. Working out fits there, obviously. So do games. Yeah, go soak in hot tubs. Mineral water hot tubs are the best. Well, I mean, there's I could just tell you about going for a swim. One of my one of my favorite things about going for a swim is that your heart rate drops. Because with the the pressure that's always on your body, plus the cold water on there, blood vessels dilate, heart rate slows down. It's one of the best things ever for that. Plus the fact that you'll never get arthritis from it, because unlike running, you have zero uh, damage to your joints. And at the same time. I also know it's like a supplement, right? Yeah, practicing piano is all kinds of things. But it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, what you're getting down to is just learning to take control of your time. If you're overthinking things, do something that, uh, that trains you to underthink. Great. Well, what's the mechanism? Like, who cares what the mechanism behind it? When I overthink, I end up stressed out and fucking things up. When I underthink, it's much better. And then for some guys, they underthink to the point where like they forget and they don't do things. Like there was a, a part in Dread where I talked about the red wine. The boys remember this. It was Vampire Squidina's husband. I, I still, that chick made me laugh, man. So it was like in the old married red pill days. I didn't even think any of us had, fl I think like when we're pleased had flair, but that was it. The rest of us were just nobodies. And she came on there and she's like, all you red pill guys. It was basically the same as Twitter. Gave all the red pill guys shit. My husband was happy and now he's miserable and I was happy and now he's treating me like shit. And what did you guys do? And everybody kind of like, look, he's sorting something out right now in his life. It's got nothing to do with you. Don't worry about it. Uh, and then some and then Blue Pill Professor, of course, is like, here, here's the uh, Laura Doyle book, The Surrendered Wife. And so she read it and it was kind of one of those leave your man alone to figure it out. Don't nag him. And and she took it as like Stepford help wise stuff. What doesn't really matter? She goes, I try to be supportive, but like he'd fuck up this and then he'd fuck up that. And I didn't say nothing. And I think it got to this house party where, hey, could you pick up some red wine? Because, you know, uh, the friends coming over, they like red wine. And then he came home and he's like, oh, I, I forgot. I didn't even think about it. My bad. And then she they did the dinner party and whatever. And then she has like a meltdown in the kitchen and he acts all like an alpha male and then he's like, I don't get it, guys. I think she's checked out. It's like, of course she's checked out. It's because, like, you're underthinking things. This is one of those weird things where a girl can handle being dismissed, but they can't handle being ignored. The idea for this one is if she's like, yeah, the friends need the red wine, whatever. And if he goes, you know what? Your buddy never touches red wine. She has half a glass. We have to throw out the bottle. We get headaches from it. So I'm just like, you know what? We'll get whatever and she'll learn to put up with it because I hate wasting money on that stuff. That, she may not agree with it, but she can get, understand it. Okay, he thought about it. He thought about the social situation. He thought about the ramifications. He made a change. He made a decision. Yeah, I can always just play. Uh, sorry, my husband didn't get the red wine. He didn't, he didn't think it was necessary. So she's got her plausible deniability. It's your fault. That's fine. But when it was like, oh, I just never even considered you or your friend on this one. That's the kind of shit that hurts. So in that case, you'd want to maybe start overthinking things. I, I will say this. Um, everybody has like a combination of two, at least that I've known so far. It needs a combination of both of them. Where. There we go, where they underthink when it comes to the important things and they overthink when it's the unimportant. Things. So in reality, it's a matter of prioritization, learning to prioritize what's important in your life, which takes us all the way back that topic I was talking about before. It's like just being able to take a day to yourself without somebody filling it and learn to say no when they want to fill your time with something. You know? uh, thoughtfully, I guess you're asking about dread. Will it benefit you? I mean, the, the sales pitch in me says it benefits everybody, 
But realistically, the whole purpose of dread is when you're in a marriage, when you're being, or a relationship where you're being taken for granted. So if you're interested in the red pill space, it's got a cultural anthropology uh, bit to it as well. You can do that to understand where guys were and how they came to the conclusions. Or you can take it from, uh, how do I, you know, get out of this shitty relationship? And there's those ones there. But other than that, you would probably want to read it as infotainment, if at all. I have to say, I don't know enough single guys who have read it and applied anything to be able to tell you if it benefits at all. So the answer is, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Chess knows it. He did a search. Why no sex? Everything was not good, Susan. So he overthought on some things, like his idea of everything being alpha, always put up with shit tests, you know, be cocky, funny at all times. He was overthinking on that stuff, but he was underthinking on what is it he was trying to accomplish. And in this case, he's just trying to not be subservient to his wife. You know? And that's and it, it just comes with practice. You have to practice and practice usually comes with mistakes and you can't be afraid of making mistakes. And this is where all those goofy platitudes come in. It's like when you feel discomfort, then that means you're out of your comfort zone. And that's a good thing. Like, all right, fair enough. But you get some asshole like uh, who's that goofy purple pill guy, the Claudio or Sergio. And then there's the other one that wears like the Roman helmet and has like the gladius sword. <laughs> hey, motherfuckers. Like, what the hell? The amount of people that like, claim to be life coaches and I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude, did you not even take one second? Like not even from like a life coach, get it together aspect, but just from like a, a branding consistency thing. You have a samurai sword with a Viking helmet and like a Roman shield. Like what, what are you trying to communicate here? Hey, you weirdos. Do you want to be weirdos, but better? Yeah. Yeah. See, Lund, uh, Lundabon. Exactly. The ex tried to shoehorn herself and the kids here today. I said I was busy, went to the gym. And that's the thing. You can be too busy to deal with somebody else, and you could have nothing to do. I went to the gym for half an hour, then I sat at home and stared at the place, the wall that the TV used to be. And that's, that's your business. Well, that's not productive. This is so much more important. It's like to you, to me, what's more important right now is sitting right here, not answering this fucking phone. <laughs> Taylor the Fiend is at least animated. Is he? Oh, speaking of which, I was so I was doing some Terrence Pot research today, and I totally didn't realize that he, TFM, Sandman, and Clary did a podcast together. Uh, Turtling Monkey has like animated monkey anime waifu things now. I was like, geez, he's going like the full Gundam style. It's almost like being a VTuber, but not looking like an anime waifu. It's crazy. That was like a year or two ago. I don't remember. Anyways. I haven't uh, made fun of anybody in a while. I don't know. But I only know what my heart feels. And my heart feels like... My heart still feels like the best... You know, the best is yet to come. I love the way girls smell. I love how you know, they always make sure, by and large, they shower. And they just have um, an amazing... An amazing smell to them in general. <laughs> the goofy bastard. How far is this sent? Is he like, what, six months, a year into his sentence so far? My heart feels terror every day I wake up in prison. <laughs> Why aren't you? You're better than this. It's like, no, we're not better than this. I'm not better than this. I'm petty as shit. You know why? You've been calling me a fucking idiot. You've been calling me a moron for three years. Of course I'm going to laugh for the next four while you're sitting in prison getting ass raped. <laughs> Look at the bright side. Dude, you know what would be awesome? Yeah, the cake tits chick. I guess she's going to jail too for the same thing. She tried stealing a table out of, out of, out of uh, Parliament or whatever you guys call it. State House. Or what's the fucking American one called? You guys don't call it Parliament. You call it something. Anyways, imagine if Stedman and cake tits because they're both put in the political prisoner wing, the, the Che Guevara wing of oh, Congress. Thank you. The Che Guevara wing. And then all of a sudden he like falls in love with cake tits, leaves his family because his new girl has more clout. And then they do like baking videos together while they, while they bitch about the JQ. <laughs> I, I, I like, hear me out. I know it sounds ridiculous, but is it any more ridiculous than Adam 22 having like a reality show of who gets to cuck his wife? <laughs> like, come on, bro. You can't tell me. You can't tell me. 
Oh yeah, by the way, that is not uh It's not real Rolo. Yeah, it's funny. Maybe he should think it's that feel before doing January 6th, the whole thing. All these guys. And that's the worst part is because, like, yeah, you get your Gonzalo Lira guy gets murdered in the Ukraine for talking shit about Russia or talking how great Russia is inside of the Ukraine. Yeah, you got Stedman getting arrested. You got take Kate Tits Girl getting arrested. You got all these people that are just ruining their lives. Uh, Daily Wire is a racist now because they fired Candace Owens. Now they don't have a black friend, but they're definitely racist. Steven Crowder's been like, my wife's the greatest. And then he's like, clean up the dog shit. And she's like, I'm leaving your ass. And then she's using his name for clout. She basically did like the, the, the Michaela Peterson thing. It's like, Hey, let me ride this skin suit into clout land. <laughs> Knowles. I still don't know who Knowles... Is that a chick or a guy? The no soup for Knowles thing. I don't even know. I just know the, the amount of dumb shit that count says it's gotta be a chick. That's gotta... No, it's a girl. There's no guy who's that fundamentally stupid without being a bimbo. Does he have giant tits at least? Like, is he one of those uh, women plus? Which, by the way, that's... I cannot believe it took me that long to think about using that for a euphemism. Women plus. <laughs> Okay, the Twitter account's a chick. That makes sense. Yeah. Anyways, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have this one go too long, by the way. I got to cut it short because we have maybe, possibly, could be a guest on Rule Zero. And I'm hosting it, so I have to do research. Yeah, who cares about these people? They need education. Well, you don't need education. You just need practice. Ultimately, that's what this all boils down to is just practice. Like, do you really think that I can that there is like 10 more book series out there based on how to develop boundaries, how to build frame, how to conduct dread. Not really. I would argue maybe, maybe if you had me give like another thorough go over the next two years doing nothing but research and, and baking it in, I could maybe squeeze another 10% of peripheral uh, concepts that would matter when it came to the big three things in the red pill, game, dread, frame. I guess boundaries. Yeah, like the, the basic concepts there. You can maybe squeeze another 10% of something new out of it. But for the most part, the place has been strip mined, which bless that. My huge problem with this is that everybody forgets everything. There's always, there's always cycles. Like the, the, the red pill today is no different than uh, the pickup artist from yesterday or the purearchy from in, like 2005. And, the Usenet groups from that. And there's always like a cycle. Everybody builds up this body of work and this body of knowledge. And then a technological change happens. It all goes away. Like, do any of you know any of the alt Usenet groups for anything? The only one I know of is alt.fast.seduction. That's it. And that's gone. Mystery kind of strip mined that and did his thing. And then Mystery was gone. And then uh, the Tom Toreo and those guys strip mined all that. Now that's gone. And now you got stupid idiots with their stupid Instagram things. Yeah, it is kind of a cycle. That was one of the big reasons to get the book. It's because like, yeah, this stuff's like even now I, I, I remember everything. I was there for it. And to go and find it now, like a good 25% of it is already gone. Link degradation, websites going down, blogs going down. Somebody's work. And there's a reason like I didn't put anything from a limitable man in frame or dread. It's because he absolutely is. He might be right. He might be wrong, but he's making shit up as he goes. And he has no idea why. After Tate found his little e-girlfriend in Korea and making fun of him on that one and him spurging out over that, I was like, there's nothing to learn from this. Nothing. Even if he's right, he's doing it for the wrong reasons or he doesn't know why it's right, which is really ultimately what matters. Because a lot of times you see the same, same behaviors. Same behaviors from a guy. One guy who gets it, one guy who doesn't get it. Even though it's the exact same thing, they have radically different results. Uh, uh, beta male for lack of a better term buying his girl flowers and kissing her on the cheek goes over far worse than you know alpha male doing the same thing and i i'm using the terms like you get it you know i hate the terms but it's to illustrate a point it's because the one guy doing it as a covert contract he's got hidden expectations to it he has no sexual tension or desire there's not the concept of like 
he could have any woman, but he picked me. It's that he picked me and now he's kissing my ass so I can give him sex versus he could have given those flowers to anybody, but he's given them to me. No expectations, no covert contracts. Like they both same behavior, two entirely different results from it. And that's ultimately why I know the whole, don't worry about who the information is coming from. As long as the information is correct. I don't think that works here. I really don't. I'm not saying you have to be the greatest of greatness to get things done, but you got to have a guy who's got, who's got, and I know I don't want to say receipts because that's ridiculous shit too, but a guy who's experienced a little bit of it, gotten some success out of his life. Otherwise the words are just meaningless pablum. They really are. So I think, uh, I think that, and I think the, the big reason for that is because there's always something that sneaks up that you don't, that you aren't aware of. And so you always have to think on your feet. There's always some level of improvisation in life. You know, you're talking to your wife, you go everything like down the book, dread 101, frame 101, whatever. Your wife does something that nobody mentioned this in the book. What do I do? Well, if you don't know what you're doing and you've just been like LARPing as the guy who understands red pill, then yeah, you're going to do, you're going to stick to what you know. Like you never raise to the, raise to the expectations put on you. You always lower to your level of training. And if you have no experience in being attractive under your belt, when you're put in one of those improvisational situations, you're going to do something stupid. You're going to do something extremely stupid. How do I know? Because every guy who's been learning and hasn't quite gotten there yet has done something stupid. Me included. Every guy who doesn't know will do something stupid if you let him figure it out for himself. And that's just... I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. I am saying it's happening. I am saying it's happening. And then the worst part is when you get the guys that don't know nothing. <laughs> Ask yourself, what would Couch do? Shut up, Dre. Do you know there's a guy in the comment section on like a two-year-old video is like, you guys realize that's not spelt Couch, right? It's spelt like a coach. They must be doing that on purpose. <laughs> yeah, every wolf account. Exactly. Alpha wolf, alpha dog. I think alpha chihuahua was kind of ironic, but even then still kind of. To this day, I still think my favorite example of like, a guy who picked a username and a pen name for the red pill that understood it the best was that guy with the, with the name fuck MR fuck the married red pill. My favorite, one of my favorite guys ever. He knew what he was doing to the point that he could counter signal like that and still be smarter than most of the other guys in there. Oh, for fuck's sakes. Yeah. Where was I going with that other point, though? Oh, yeah, the experience part. Yeah, they just don't know. They'll lower to their uh, expectations. And that's the problem, is that... So the guy who's learning, he's going to make mistakes. That goes without saying. But when he goes, when he makes mistakes, and he's engaging with somebody else, like he's talking with his buddies, or he's talking with an a, a asshole yelling into a camera wearing spectacles online, or whatever... If that guy has experience, that's where that little turning point happens. Because if the guy makes the mistake and the other guy doesn't know why, he's going to default to his training too. So now not only do you have a mistake being made, you know, mistake being a suboptimal way of achieving a certain result, you're going to have a piss poor feedback loop. Well, have you tried blah, blah, blah? Have you tried blah, blah, blah? Then the guy will try that. It doesn't work. I haven't tried that. It doesn't work. And now the ego of the speaker is on the line where he goes, well, you're just not doing it hard enough. I'm right. There's no way I'm not right, because otherwise I shouldn't be giving you advice, right? Yeah. But then you get a guy who did know it. It's like, well, you know, this is like guys have made this mistake before. A very easy one is the rewarding good behavior, not rewarding bad behavior one. I, I see it all the time where a guy will start acting proper, you know, dread, frame, red pill, game, all that stuff. And then his wife starts responding more sexually to it and they're having a better sex life from it. And the guy has the great idea is like, well, now that she's acting good, I can reward her good behavior. And for him, when he thinks reward, he reverts back to his old way of doing things. And then he wonders, I don't get it. I rewarded her and now she's acting worse. What's going on with that? And then you realize as if you have no experience and like, well, just try it harder. Gets worse. Talk to a guy that knows what he's doing. It's like, let me get this straight. You started acting a certain way. Your wife started acting better towards you. And your idea of a reward of that kind of behavior is to act the way you were back when she was not attracted to you. 
That's what you're saying. And then when the guy kind of frames it that way, he's like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. Okay, so what do you do? First off, you got to understand what a reward is. A reward is not buying flowers. A reward is not anything. A reward is your time, your affection, and your attention. A reward is engaging with something. If a girl's having a fight with you and you start yelling back, whether you have a good reason for it or not, ultimately what you're doing is rewarding the concept of a fight for engagement. And this is why everybody's like, fight has to have two people in it. An argument has two people in it. If she's yelling at you and you refuse to have a fight back, if you refuse to let her bad mood affect your good mood, you're not rewarding bad behavior, ultimately. And it's one of those serious things you can see happening where uh, a girl will, like, she's yelling at you, nothing happens. Silent treatment, nothing happens. Eventually, they get to the idea that, you know what? All right, fine. Maybe it's a point of desperation. They start using open communication. They start talking to you like a guy would talk to you, in which case you can have that conversation. Maybe it's the case where they just start crying and they don't know what to do. And then in that case, you can just, you know, provide a better way ahead, an exit to the hamster maze, whatever. But ultimately, once you understand the difference between rewards and rewards, life gets better. Yeah, I am. It is written. Oh, I forgot about it is written. That fucking guy. <laughs> uh, I remember that he wanted to be everybody's friend. And I was like, as soon as I saw him with the, the gay loop, I'm like, yeah, no, 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 man. Don't work with retards. Don't work with people who work with retards. And he loved retards. And I'm like, not happening. Yeah, right. But mentally ill guys with all abstraction, no action. Anyways, so that's it. That's all I got for you guys today. I have to go. So I guess, I mean, if you've seen the thumbnail for the video, I, I'm not spoiling a surprise, but Clary reached out to Terrence Pop and he has a link. He may or may not show up. I, I He says he will, but you never know. I never got like confirmation myself, so I'm hoping. So this is going to go one of two ways. A, Terrence is going to come up. We're going to have like five military veterans sitting here shooting the shit. Or... He's not going to be there, and it turns out a couple of the Rule Zero guys don't really know about him anyway, so it's going to turn into a, uh, hey, did you guys know who was doing all of this? Like, I, I can't do the quote there, because this is too much of like a, a an, uh, CBC Radio 3 thing, but there was this thing. Do you guys know who Sidney Poitier is? An actor, black actor in the 60s. Huge, super successful. And there used to be a saying back then, is that if you can't hire Sidney Poitier, Rewrite the character as a white guy. Rewrite the character as a white guy. So Terrence Pop is that for like, there was no MGTOW. There was no red pill. There was no Tradcon. There was none of that shit. There was just Terrence. Terrence and his whiteboard. Some of his videos were talking about MGTOW stuff. Some of it stuff was whaminate shit stuff. Some of it was very red pilled stuff. He had to do everything, and he and I, you got to give the guy credit. He made a whiteboard entertaining as hell. So he's like the Sidney Poitier of the Red Pill. And then I guess for me, the big things I want to know, because I used to be a huge fan of him. Me and my girl used to watch his stuff all the time when it came out. Kind of dropped off during Adpocalypse, but that's because Terrence kind of dropped off. Uh, which, don't, don't can't blame you if like, they're fucking over your funding in that. Is I want to talk about his pro boxing career, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best not to make jokes about Myron trying to box everybody, but in, you know it's going to sneak in there. Uh, I was going to talk about he had a seven-year hiatus after his wife pulled his bullshit. Dude, she John Wicked his dog. Fucking hell. The fact that he didn't kill people there is pretty amazing. I'm definitely going to bring up administrative violence because he was my introduction to the red pill just from his administrative violence thing. Uh, our mutual dislike for the hot takes of Matt Walsh. And then there was uh, some of his videos. I'll probably talk about which ones he liked. And then he has a speech he gave at the International Conference on Men's Issues and Male Suicide that he uh, dedicated to Major Lance Waldorf, who's a friend of his. So I guess on Fresh and Fit, he brought out like he has like dog tags of guys he saved. He actually keeps a tally, a running tally of guys who are going to commit suicide. And he saved. And I think that's pretty cool, especially since people now just make up testimonials of all the lives they've saved or. You know, people that want validation from their favorite influencer online just say, thank you for saving my life, but you didn't really. So he's actually seen some shit, so that'll be pretty interesting. Anyways.
No sound? What? Son of a bitch, try it again. If you're sitting there going, oh, I play Tekken for pennies. My name's Ryan Stone. Your life sucks. Your life sucks. Your life sucks. It's all Amen. your fault. It's all Amen. your fault. You, you can't half do anything. It's better to do nothing than to half do something. <laughs> you just have to accept it. F it. Let's go into ranked. If I wasn't prepared to literally impoverish his entire bloodline, I wouldn't have done anything. So he, he's, he absolutely nailed it. Don't start something you weren't prepared to finish. Don't start something you weren't prepared to finish. If I wasn't prepared, to literally impoverish his entire bloodline. His entire bloodline. Entire bloodline. I wouldn't have done anything. It's all Amen. your fault. It's all Amen. your fault. It's all your fault. My name's Ryan Stone. I play Tekken for pennies. It's all your fault. I love padding the show with that. <laughs> uh, you guys were asking the thing. Was that a lot of fun to make? It was actually a slog, a fucking cancerous slog. So just the scene with like a lot of the split screening stuff that probably took like six hours, mostly because like adding six high def videos into the same thing is very hard to render properly and get the, get it to sync right to the music was fucking horrible. Um, I have a bunch of like smaller versions of it too, which are like entertaining. I know I might go back to streaming tech and eight. I, I quit it for like a month and I was trying it out again. I'm like, eh, maybe it's not that bad. But anyways, whatever. I'm going to make fun of that stupid uh, Edmonton broad. And then we're going to get ready for the next cast in about an hour. About an hour. Where is she anyway? Erudite. Erudite. Oh, there's, there's that goofy bitch. So I used to be a pretty strong feminist. I've actually become a feminist again. Ooh. Feminists, though, can be some of the worst people you'll ever meet. They can be, like, some of the most nasty. They'll take advantage of uh, contradictory uh, world values, right? Worldview, which is that, like, I'm talking about, like, psychology and mental health for men, and yet yeah. I'm in a field that, like, is overly feminized and shoving drugs down men's throat. And I'm, like, and I'm yeah. still recommending it because I don't want to lose, like, the baby out with the bathwater. Just because not all therapists are well-trained to work with men. Just because a lot of therapists might even be biased against particularly, like, incel-type men. If they hear misogynistic language at all, they might, like, shut yeah. you down. So, and, and it was just difficult because I didn't want to be, like, super, like, nasty and mean or anything. <laughs> <laughs> fuck do i do for a living all right later guys Seventy-nine T twenty-four fifty-eight. Learning, learning corp little red riding hood take one